Hi guys, so today we will be discussing the digestive system lecture. So we are more on the physiology of digestive system rather than the anatomy of digestive system. So as we may know, the human digestive system is consists of gastrointestinal tract plus accessory organs of digestion. So when we say digestion, it involves the breakdown of food into smaller particles and smaller components until they can be absorbed and assimilated into the body. So each part of the digestive system has their own function and uh, all around the digestive system we have different enzymes that help in breaking the food particles into a smaller particle that can be absorbed and utilized by our body. So what are the function of your digestive system? So first, we have the ingestion of solid and liquid. That's the part where we eat. So it is the consumption of solid and liquid food, usually through our mouth. So second is the digestion of organic molecules. So when we say digestion, it's the breakdown of large organic molecule into smaller molecules that can be absorbed and utilized by our body. So digestion occur through mechanical and chemical means. When we say mechanical, it's when we chew the food into smaller bits. And when we say chemical, um, all the enzymes in our body are involved. So next is absorption. Absorption of nutrients. So Absorption is the movement of molecule out of the digestive tract and into the blood or lymphatic system. So, so it's in the process of absorption that we are preparing the molecules, the nutrients from our for the from, from the food that we eat to be utilized by our body. And lastly, we have the elimination of waste. So when we eliminate, you know, it, it's the removal of undigested material such as fiber from the food plus other waste product from the body as we know it's called feces the digestive system consists of the digestive tract plus spe specified associated organs so the digestive tract is also referred to as gi tract so the tract is one long tube from your mouth to your anus so let us discuss one by one the parts and component of your digestive tract so first we have the oral cavity or what we call the mouth the pharynx the esophagus the stomach small intestine large intestine rectum and your you know, so we will be discussing um different function of the following parts as well as the component um a little bit of part of this um uh, parts like the epithelium, the mucosa layer, its function. Uh, say, for example, small intestine's main function is absorption. So, we will discuss each of them as we go by. So, we have the associated organs. So, these are the organs that are not directly into the digestive tract. As I've said a while ago, digestive tract is a very long tube from your mouth to your anus. So, these associated organs are not directly in the tube. Hence, they have ducts that will empty and will lead you into the tract, so into the digestive tract. So, these associated organs are the salivary glands, the liver, the gallbladder, and your pancreas. So, let us discuss the layers or the tissue covering of your digestive tract wall. So, we have four tissue covering of your digestive tract wall. We call them tunics. So, similar to your blood vessel, we have layers that we also call, uh, call it tunics. So, we have the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, and the serosa or adventitia. Do note that um, each of them has their sub-layer. So, do not be confused when you see a muscle layer or muscle tissue in your mucosa. So first, we have the innermost layer. We call it the mucosa and it secretes mucus. That's why it, it is called mucosa. So it, mucosa has three more layers or sub-layers. We call it the inner mucus epithelium or the epithelium layer. The loose connective tissue or the connective tissue layer, we call it the lamina propria. And 
the last part is a thin outer layer of smooth muscle that we call a muscularis mucosae. Do not be confused when you see muscularis mucosae. You might be thinking that it is very, uh, it is similar to muscularis, but uh, the muscularis mucosae can be only found on your mucosa layer or tunic. These four tunics can be uh, discussed in depth in your laboratory part, but we will tackle each of them. So when you say submucosa, submucosa is above the mucosa, and you can always see a blood vessel, nerves, and small glands in this layer. The next tunic or layer is the muscularis. So in most part of the digestive tract, it consists of the inner layer of circular smooth muscle and the outer layer of a longitudinal smooth muscle. Some of the um, digestive tract parts have also a an oblique muscle. So the fourth part is your serosa or your adventitia. So it is the outermost layer and we call it serosa if it the if if the peritoneum is present and we call it the adventitia if there is no peritoneum. So what is a peritoneum again? We have discussed this on chapter one. When we say peritoneum, it is a smooth epithelial layer and it's underlying connective tissue. So remember the um, pericardium, peritoneum, and then the and pleura, and they are all divided into your visceral and your parietal one. So peritoneum, uh, if there's a peritoneum, uh, it is called a serosa, and if there is no peritoneum, it is called the adventitia. So here is an illustration of the four parts of your digestive tract. So the mucosa is the one near the lumen. The part near the lumen. So the histology of digestive tract will be discussed in depth in your laboratory part. So here is a peritoneum, which is a layer of smooth uh, epithelial tissue, and we have here the mesenteries, which is a connective tissue of organs in the abdominal cavity. We also see in this illustration uh, the abdominal organs that have no mesenteries and they are referred to as retroperitoneal. So the retroperitoneal organs lie along the abdominal wall and include the duodenum, the pancreas, the ascending colon, the descending colon, rectum, kidneys, adrenal gland, and your urinary bladder. So let's start discussing each part that I have the major part of your digestive tract, which is your oral cavity, which is the first part of your digestive system. So it contains uh, non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So, and we all know, we have discussed this in your muscular system, that the lips is a muscular structure formed mostly by your orbicularis oris muscle. The lips and your cheeks are, the, are important uh, part for your mastication. When you say mastication, it is um, chewing. So mastication begins the process of your mechanical digestion. It is also in your oral cavity that we found the associated organ that we call the salivary glands. So salivary glands uh, produce saliva which contains enzyme to break down the carbohydrate into glucose. So it cleanses the mouth and dissolves and moistens the food. It is also in your oral cavity that you release an enzyme we call the amylase. The amylase is a salivary enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates into smaller molecules. So we also have lysozyme, which is a salivary enzyme that are active against bacteria. So the tongue is a house uh, of taste buds and mucus. The tongue is divided depending on the amount of taste buds. So the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is covered by a papillae, some of which contains taste buds. So this papillae can be seen under your microscope in your laboratory. So the posterior one-third, the remaining one, of the tongue is devoid of papillae and has only a few scattered taste buds. So in addition, the posterior portion does contain a large amount of lymphatic tissue uh, which helps form the lingual tonsils. As you may know, when we eat the food, um, it uh, introduces a lot of uh, foreign substance inside our body and our um, oral cavity is the first to encounter those foreign substances. So it must have a lymphatic tissue 
um, that contains a lot of white blood cell, a white blood cell that is necessary to monitor and warns the body that there is an unnecessary foreign objects that enters the body. These lymphatic tissues helps to form the lingual tonsils. As you may know, tonsils is a part of your lymphatic system. The teeth is also discussed in your skeletal system, but let us take a quick review of the teeth. So we have 32 teeth in normal adult. So we have the incisor, the canine, the premolar, molar, and the wisdom tooth. So uh, 20 primary teeth, which is the baby teeth, and um, each tooth has a crown, cusp, neck, and root. So the center of the tooth is a pulp cavity, and enamel is the hard covering that protects against abrasion. So the cavities are breakdown of enamel by acid from the bacteria. We also have the palate. The palate is divided into two, with it, which is the soft and hard palate. The palate is a roof of oral cavity, so the hard palate is the anterior part while the soft palate is the posterior part near your uvula or, a t or the tissue projection and extension of your soft palate. There are three major pairs of salivary glands. We have the parotid gland, the submandibular glands, and the sublingual glands. When we say parotid glands, it is a more of a serous gland it is located just anterior to, to each ear. So when you have a mumps or yung beke, which is an inflammation of your parotid gland caused by a viral infection. So we also have the submandibular gland, which secretes or produce more serous than mucus secretion. So each gland can be felt as a soft lump along the inferior border of your mandible. That's why it's called, it is called submandibular glands. So... The third gland is your sublingual gland, which is the smallest of the three paired salivary glands. So it produces primarily um, mucus secretion. Please also take time to read Table 16.1, the function of your digestive secretion. The pharynx is also or commonly known as your throat. So it connects the mouth to your esophagus. So it has three parts as we have discussed this in your respiratory system. We have the nasopharynx, which is the upper portion, the oropharynx, which is the middle one, and your laryngopharynx is your uh, most inferior part of the pharynx near your larynx. We will not discuss the pharynx in depth because we have already discussed the pharynx in your respiratory system. Let's move on to your esophagus. The esophagus is a muscular tube and it is lined with moist stratified squamous epithelium. It is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. The esophagus is divided into the upper two-thirds of uh, which is composed of skeletal muscle in its wall, while the lower one-third has a smooth muscle on its wall. So we have a heartburn which occur when gastric juices regurgitate into esophagus. So it may be caused by caffeine, smoking, or eating or drinking in excess. Swallowing or deglutition can be divided into three phases. We have the voluntary phase, the pharyngeal phase, and the esophageal phase. So during the voluntary phase, a bolus or a mass of food is formed in the mouth. So the tongue pushes the bolus against the heart palate and then this forces the bolus towards the posterior part of the mouth and into the oropharynx. So in the pharyngeal phase of swallowing is controlled by a reflex. So this phase is initiated when a bolus of food stimulates receptors in the oropharynx to elevate the soft palate, closing off the nasopharynx. The esophageal phase of swallowing is responsible for moving food from the pharynx to stomach. So the muscular contraction of the esophagus occurs in peristaltic waves. So when we say peristalsis, it is a wave-like contraction that moves the food through your digestive tract. Let's move on to our stomach. So the stomach is located in the abdomen and it is a storage tank for food that can hold up to 2 liters of food. So our stomach produces mucus, hydrochloric acid, proteins, and digesting enzyme. So it contains a thick mucus that has a pH of 3. So the opening from your esophagus to your stomach is called the gastroesophageal opening. And your stomach is divided into three regions. 
So the three region is the cardiac region, the body, and the pyloric region. So the cardiac region is the opening of the gastroesophageal into the stomach region. And the body is the largest part of the stomach. So as we go down your stomach, we encounter the pyloric region. The pyloric region is the region of the stomach near the pyloric opening, whereas the pyloric opening is the opening into the small intestine. Meaning, the, py the pyloric region is the borderline of your stomach to your uh, small intestine, while your cardiac region is the borderline of your stomach to your esophagus. And cardiac region is near your heart. That's why it is called cardiac. So, we have discussed the different layers of your digestive tract a while ago. So, in your stomach, the muscular layer uh, contains the outer longitudinal, middle circular, and inner oblique to produce a churning sound. So, we also have the rugae or the large fold that allows the stomach to stretch whenever it is filled with more food. So, inside the stomach, we also have an enzyme, we call it the chyme which is a paste-like substance that forms when food begins to be broken down. The stomach is lined with simple columnar epithelium. So the mucosal surface forms the numerous tube-like gastric pits. In the gastric pit, we have what we call a gastric, gastric gland. So uh, we have different cells of the gastric gland, which will be discussed more in your laboratory. But this four cell is called the mucous neck cell, the parietal cell, the endocrine cell, and the chief cell. So these cells are responsible in producing mucus, hydrochloric acid, and intrinsic factor, uh, regulate the chemical, and pepsinogen respectively. Aside from chyme, the stomach secretion from the gastric glands includes hydrochloric acids, pepsin, mucus, and intrinsic factor. So hydrochloric acid produces a pH of about, uh, of about 2 in the stomach. So it's very acidic that it can kill microorganisms and activates the enzyme pepsin. So this pepsin is converted in its inactive form, which is the pepsinogen. Pepsin breaks covalent bond of protein to form a smaller peptide chain. So, pepsin exhibits optimum enzymatic activity at a pH of about 2, which is a pH that, uh, pr that, is, that is produced by the hydrochloric acid. Uh, next is the mucus, which is a thick layer that lubricates the epithelial cell in the stomach. So, uh, irritation of the stomach may cause stimulus the secretion of greater volume of your mucus. Lastly is the intrinsic factor. You'll discuss intrinsic factor in your hematology. But intrinsic factor binds with vitamin B12, which is produced in the liver and makes it more readily absorbable by the small intestine. So the vitamin B12 is very important because it is uh, uh, used in the synthesis of your deoxyribonucleic acid and in the red blood cell production. Deficiencies of your vitamin B12 might cause different types of anemia. So, the regulation of your stomach secretion is divided into cephalic phase, gastric phase, and intestinal phase. So, the first phase is the cephalic phase, and it is where the stomach secretions are initiated by sight, smell, taste, or food thought. So, the second phase is the gastric phase, where in the partial di partially digested protein and distension of stomach promotes a secretion. In gastric phase, it is the period during which the greatest volume of gastric secretion occurs. So, the third phase is the intestinal phase. It is where the gastric secretion primarily inhibit the gastric secretions. So, acidic, the acidic chyme stimulates neuronal reflexes and secretions of hormones that inhibit gastric secretion by negative feedback loop. So in gastric phase, there's an increase of gastric um, acid uh, produced in the secretion, while in intestinal phase, it produces uh, ho hormones and other gastric secretions that will stop or decrease the amount of gastric secretion that is occurring in your gastric phase. So let us summarize the regulation of your gastric secretion. So once gastric acid secretion begins, further secretion is controlled by the negative feedback loop involving the nerves and the hormones. So let us summarize uh, the gastric acid regulation. 
secretion regulation. So once the gastric acid secretion begins, further secretion is controlled by the negative feedback loop that we have discussed, discussed in chapter 1. So this involves the nerves and the hormones. So first, during our gastric phase, high acid level in the stomach trigger a decrease in additional acid secretion. Second, on the last phase, which is the intestinal phase, the acidic kind entering to the wood in them triggers a decrease in acidic or the gastric acid secretion. This negative feedback loop ensures that the acidic chyme entering the duodenum is neutralized, which is required for the digestion of food by pancreatic enzymes and for the prevention of peptic ulcer formation. So, as we have discussed a while ago, the movement in the stomach is called the perist is due to the peristaltic waves and the mixing waves. So, the mixing wave is the weak contraction that is thoroughly mixing the food to form a chyme. So, the peristaltic waves is a more stronger contraction than the mixing wave wherein the the chyme is forced toward and through the pyloric sphincter. So the hormonal and neural mechanism stimulates the stomach secretion. The stomach empties every 4 hours after regular meal and 6 to 8 hours after a high fatty meal. So let us uh, move on to our small intestine which is, uh, let's have a brief um, introduction to our small intestine's anatomy. So it measures 6 meters in length and uh, you have to memorize and remember that the major abs uh, function of the small intestine is absorption because uh, a huge uh, amount of absorption of molecules and nutrients happen in our small intestine. So the chyme takes 3 to 5 hours to pass through and it contains enzyme to further break down the food. So it can also contains the secretion for protection against the acidity of the chyme from our stomach. So, our intestine has three parts, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. So, let's have a brief anatomy of the duodenum. It is the first part of your small intestine and it is 25 centimeters long. And the epithelium of the mucosa layer or tunic of the small intestine is simple columnar epithelium with microvilli. So, this microvilli increase the surface area of the small intestine for better absorption of molecule. So, it also contains different types of cell, major cells. So, these are uh, the four cells, which is the absorptive cells, goblet cell, granular cells, and the endocrine cells. So, again, it contains microvilli and many folds and it contains bile and pancreatic ducts. So this is where uh, your liver and pancreas and gallbladder uh, empties their secretions. So let's discuss the four major cells of your duodenum. So first, the absorptive cells have microvilli. So it produces digestive enzymes and it absorbs digestive food. While your goblet cell, your second major cell, um produce a protective mucus for the acidity of the chyme. And the granular cell helps protect the intestinal epithelium from the bacteria. Your endocrine, of course, your endocrine cell produces regulatory hormones needed by the function of your small intestine. The epithelial cell are located within the tubular gland of the mucosa, the duodenum. So it is called intestinal gland or Crips of Libercoon. So, Crips of Libercoon will also be encountered in your anatomy, physiology, laboratory part. The second part is the jejunum, which is uh, 2.5 meter long, meters long and abs it absorbs the nutrients. The last part is the ileum, which is the third part and it is 3.5 meters long. So, you will see in the ileum, especially when you look in the microscope, there's a cluster or lymphatic nodules common in the entire length of the digestive tract, and it, but it is more commonly seen in your ileum. This lymphatic nodule is called your Peer's patches. So the movement of the small intestine is very similar to those of 
the stomach. So, mixing and propulsion of the chyme are the primary mechanical events that occur in the small intestine. So, we have the peristaltic contraction, segment, and segmental contraction. So, when we say peristaltic contraction, uh, it proceeds uh, along the length of the intestine for a variable distance and cause the chyme to move along the small intestine. And then, when we say segmental contraction, they are it propagate for only short distance and mixed intestinal content. Again, when we talk about distance, the peristaltic contraction has a variable distance, while the segmental contraction uh, is for only uh, short distances. So let's start discussing the anatomy of your liver. So liver is one of the two largest accessory organs in your digestive system. So the liver and the pancreas pro uh, produce a secretion that empties in the duodenum part of your small intestine. So the liver weighs about 3 pounds and it is located in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen under the diaphragm. So it has um, right, left caudate and quadrate lobes. So the liver's function is to process the nutrients and detoxifies the harmful substance from the blood together with the kidney. The liver is the largest internal organ in the body. So we have the porta, which is the gate where the blood vessels, ducts, nerves enter and exits. So it receives the arterial blood from the hepatic artery. The liver is consists of two major loops, the right and left loop. The liver receives blood from two sources, which is the hepatic artery that delivers oxygenated blood to the liver which supplies the liver cells with oxygen. The hepatic portal vein that carries the nutrient-rich blood from the digestive tract to the liver. So blood exits the liver through hepatic vein. And then the hep hepatic veins empties into the inferior vena cava to your heart. So the lobules of the liver is divided with portal triad on each corner. So the portal triad contains the hepatic artery that delivers the fresh blood, the hepatic portal vein that delivers the nutrients-rich blood from the intestine, and the hepatic duct that delivers the used blood to your inferior vena cava to your heart. So we also have hepatic uh, cords, which is... Um, between center margin of each lobule and is separated by hepatic sinusoids. The hepatic sinusoids contain phagocytic cells that remove foreign particles from the blood. So, the hepatic cords formed by a platelet-like group of liver cells. We call the liver cells hepatocytes. They are located between the center and margin of each lobule. We also have a central vein uh, which is uh, found in the center of each lobule and where mixed bloods flow towards. It forms the hepatic vein. So the, we have different types of liver ducts. We have the we have the hepatic duct. We have the common hepatic duct, cystic duct, and common bile duct. So the hepatic duct transports the bile out of the liver. So what is bile? Bile is a fluid that is made and released by the liver and is stored by the gallbladder. So the bile helps to di helps digestion and it breaks down fats into fatty acid which can be taken into the body by the digestive tract. So uh, we also have the common hepatic duct. So the common hepatic duct forms from left and right hepatic duct. And we also have the cystic duct which joins common hepatic duct. It is a duct from the gallbladder. So common uh, hepat uh, common bile duct formed from common hepatic duct and cystic, cystic duct that empty into the duodenum. So let's move on to our pancreas. The pancreas has, has been discussed in our endocrine system and it has a major function in both endocrine and exocrine function of the body. So the pancreas is located posterior to the stomach in an in, in inferior part of the left upper quadrant. So it has three parts. We have the head, the body, and the tail. So the head near is near the midline of the body and the tail it extends to the left and touches the spleen. So the endocrine tissue have pancreatic eyelets or what we call the eyelet of longer hands. Uh, it produces insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin that uh, regulate your blood sugar. So your 
exocrine tissue of the pancreas uh, produces digestive enzymes that travels through the ducts into the uh, duodenum or the small intestine. So there are three major protein digesting enzymes that is secreted by the exocrine part of the pancreas outside your islet of Langerhans. So we have the trypsin, the chymotrypsin, and the carboxypeptidase. One of the exocrine function of the pancreas is the production of your bicarbonate ions. So aside from digestive enzymes, the bicarbonate ions neutralizes the acidic chyme from your um, stomach that enters the small intestine. So the increase in pH resulting from the secretion of um, bicarbonate ions stops the pepsin digestion but provides the proper environment for the function of your pancreatic enzyme. So moving on to your large intestine, which has a function which is to absorb the water from indigestible food. Um, uh, it is consists of three parts, which is the secum, the colon, and the rectum. So the secum, the junction between the secum and your small intestine is called the ileocecal junction. So the fourth part of the large intestine is the anal, anal canal. So attached to the secum is a tube about 9 cm long called the appendix. So the appendicitis is an inflammation of appendix that usually occur because of obstruction. So the secretion from the appendix cannot, cannot pass the obstruction. Therefore, they accumulate causing the enlargement or inflammation and pain of the appendix. So bacteria around the appendix can cause infection. Symptoms include Sudden abdominal pain, particularly in the right lower quadrant at a specific point, we call it the McBurney point. So from your secum, it will then continue to the colon, which is 1.5 meter long, and it contains ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid region. So the ascending colon extends superiorly from the secum to the right colic flexure near the liver where it turns to the left. And the transverse colon extends from the right colic flexure to the left colic flexure near the spleen where the colon turns inferiorly. The descending colon extends from the left colic flexure to the pelvis where it becomes the sigmoid colon. The sigmoid colon forms the L-shaped tube that enters the medially and then inferiorly into the pelvic cavity and ends at the rectum. So the mucosa lining of the colon contains numerous straight tubular glands we call crypts, which um, contain many mucus-producing goblet cells, and the longitudinal smooth muscle layer of the colon does not completely envelop the intestinal wall, but form three bands we call tenia coli. So the rectum is a straight muscular tube that begins at the termination of the sigmoid colon, a part of your colon, and ends at the anal canal. So the muscular tunic is composed of smooth muscle and is relatively thick in the rectum compared to the rest of the digestive part. Lastly, the anal canal lasts 2 to 3 cm of the digestive tract. So a food takes 18 to 24 hours to pass through. And feces is, is the product of water, indigestible food, and microbes. So microbes synthesize the vitamin K. So what are the digestive process? So first we have the digestion, then the propulsion, and then the absorption, and then the defecation. Digestive process starts with uh, digestion. So it is the breakdown of food that occurs in the stomach and your mouth. So as we have discussed a while ago, in our oral cavity, in our mouth, there, uh, this is where the digestion starts. It, we call it the mechanical digestion. And then we go to propulsion. So propulsion is the movement of food through the digestive tract. And it includes the swallowing and the peristalsis, which is the movement of food down to your digestive tract. Then we have the absorption, which is primarily in the duodenum and jejun of the small intestine. As we have known, the small intestine's main function is absorption. And then we have the last part, the defecation, which is the elimination of the waste substances in the form of feces. So as you may see in this illustration, 
the breaking down of the food depends on the molecule of the food. So, if it is carbohydrate, it will be then um, uh, broken down into monosaccharide. And if it's lipid, it will then be broken down into a fatty acid and monoglycerides. And if it's a protein, it will then be broken down by different enzymes into um, amino acid, which is a building block of your proteins. Um, this following results of the breaking down of the enzymes uh, can be absorbed easily by the body. Please check this um, illustration for a clearer view in your book, Anatomy Physiology, Silis, uh, figure 16.23. So, how is carbohydrate digested? So, first, um, the polysaccharides, the carbohydrates, split into disaccharide by salivary and pancreatic amylase. As you may know, our oral cavity, our salivary glands, produces salivary amylase. And pancreas, of course, produces the pancreatic amylase. So, these disaccharides are broken down into monosaccharide, which is one sugar unit by an enzyme we call it disaccharidases on the surface of your intestinal epithelium. So, the monosaccharide, like glucose, is absorbed by co-transport with sodium into the intestinal epithelium. So, glucose is carried by the hepatic portal vein to the liver and enters smooth cell by facilitated diffusion. We have studied in chapter 1 that the glucose is the key to produce an ATP or an energy in the cell um, organelles, which is the mitochondria. Next is lipid digestion. Um, these topics will be discussed. The carbohydrate, lipids, and protein digestion will also be discussed in your biochemistry. So we will not be in-depth with the processes of the um, digestion of this um, compound. So, in lipid digestion, the lipase breaks down triglyceride into fatty acids and monosaccharide. Take note that lipase is produced in the pancreas. So, the bile salts that is produced in the liver and stored in the gallbladder surrounds the fatty acid and monoglycerides to form a micelles. A micelle is attached to the plasma membrane of the intestinal epithelial cell and the fatty acid and monoglyceride pass by simple diffusion into the intestinal epithelial cell. The micelle has a polar part and a polar part. So the lipoproteins uh, is a discussion in your clinical chemistry. So lipids are packed are packaged into lipoproteins to allow the transport into the lymph in your blood. So lipoprotein are molecules that are part water soluble and part lipid soluble. So meaning they are part polar, part nonpolar. So since lymph and blood contains water and lipids are not water soluble. So lipoproteins are necessary for the transport. Lipid is nonpolar, so enable for it to be transported into a into an environment that is that contains water it will be uh, mixed or combined with a protein um, transport and then the protein transport plus lipid we call it the lipoprotein so the lipoprotein includes the chylomicron the ldl or the low density lipoprotein which is called the bad cholesterol and the high density lipoprotein which is called the good cholesterol so, what is protein digestion? So, how does protein being digested inside the body? So, we have an enzyme that we call pepsin. Pepsin is a protein digesting enzyme secreted by the stomach. So, the pancreas secretes trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. As we have discussed a while ago, these are the three major enzymes produced by your um, exocrine part of the pancreas. Uh, they are produced and secreted into the small intestine in an inactive state. So, in the small intestine, these enzymes are activated. Uh, they also uh, neutralize the acidic chyme from your stomach. So, lastly, water and minerals can move across the intestinal wall in the either direction. So, the movement depends on the osmotic pressure similar to your um, blood vessels. It depends on the osmotic blood vessels and tissues, capillaries and tissues. It depends on the osmotic pressure. So, 99% of water entering the intestine is absorbed and minerals are actively transported across the wall of the small intestine. 
So, in your book, please read the effect uh, of aging in your digestive system as well as the diseases involved in the digestive system. That ends our discussion. I hope you have learned. Thank you for listening. And uh, I am posting a lot of practice quizzes in my YouTube channel. Be sure to check it in the uh, link shown here. So, thank you and stay safe.